and welcome to today's podcast, Why and How to Educate Employees About Price Transparency. This program is brought to you by the Healthcare Administrators Association, HCAA. For over 40 years, HCAA has supported third-party administrators and the self-insured employer industry through educational opportunities from leading industry experts. For information on joining HCAA, please visit our website, hcaa.org. I'm your host, Ramesh Kumar, and I'm on a mission to bring value to the healthcare industry through improved transparency. And my goal from this podcast is to give you one aha moment that you can implement in your business, whether you are a TPA, broker, or an employer. In my day job, I run a company called Zaki Point Health that helps self-insured employers and their employees find meaning from their healthcare data. Please like or share this podcast on your favorite podcasting tool so we can bring together a community of like-minded professionals. Before we begin, I would like to bring you a word from our sponsor, Via Group. Via Group is an experienced provider of healthcare cost containment technologies, techniques, offering comprehensive consulting services, legal expertise, plan document drafting, subrogation and overpayment recovery, claim negotiation and plan defense, designed to control costs and protect plan assets. Today, we have Marshall Allen, an American journalist, who, with Alex Richards, won the 2011 Goldsmith Prize for investigative reporting. And he's the author of the book, Never Pay the First Bill. And he's also the creator of educational videos to help employees fight their healthcare bills to talk about why and how to educate your employees about price transparency. Marshall, while writing this book, had his own encounter with the healthcare system. Today on our podcast, you will learn what type of price or billing abuse is going on in the healthcare market. Why educating your member population about healthcare transparency works. What are the steps to take to educate your member population? Let's dig in. Marshall, I'm super excited to have you on our podcast today. I read your book, really insightful. In fact, uh, one thing that really caught my attention was how you really got going into writing this with your dad's journey. I actually have had my own journey with my kind of helping my dad that got me into healthcare. So not just at a personal level for me, but I'm actually really interested to hear your kind of story, if you can bring our listeners up to date in terms of the background and also what got you to write this book. Well, even before I wrote about my dad's struggle that my mom and dad had in a assisted living facility in Colorado, I really felt burdened by all the calls and emails that I get from patients every day. I'm contacted by people who are being overcharged. They're the victims of ridiculously high prices and error-filled medical bills. And unfortunately, even when they identify errors in their bills or um, unjustified high prices, the hospitals or the insurance companies or whoever's charging these prices, they don't back down. Even when they've made obvious errors and mistakes, you'll have patients who say, this claim has a billing code for a service that was never provided. But the insurance companies tend to just take the word of the hospitals or the doctors or whoever is the medical clinician providing the care or the billing department. You know, it might not even be the doctor who put that in the record, but the billing department interpreted the medical record and added charges to the claims. So, I mean, there are cases of just blatant errors in medical bills that don't get corrected. And then the patient gets billed. And if the patient doesn't pay the bill, the patient goes to collections. And so I really started writing the book for that reason. I wanted to help guide people to know what to do to take on some of these overpriced medical bills or error-filled medical bills to defend themselves. And in the midst of that, I then had my own family go through one of these situations. And so My family situation was this. I was living at the time in New Jersey. I actually just moved to Texas. So I've just been here for about three weeks now. And I'm originally from Colorado and that's where my mom and dad still live. And my dad, unfortunately, suffers from dementia. 
And this was about almost two years ago now that this happened. And his dementia was very early stage. He was able to take care of himself, but it was just too much for my mom to take care of him. So they admitted him to a facility where she said, well, he'll still go to his regular clinician for all of his medical care because my dad physically is very healthy. So he doesn't need any routine medical care here at this facility. Well, unbeknownst to my mom, and my mom, by the way, has power of attorney for my dad. So all medical decision making needs to go through my mom. Well, unbeknownst to her, a nurse practitioner for the group that serves the, the facility did an examination of my dad and even put him on a medication that he wasn't supposed to be on. So there are two problems. There was a medication error and there was a bill that came along with this examination, which was an exam that my mom had not consented to. Thankfully, my mom, after about a month, caught the medication error. It did cause some decline in my dad, but he was able to rebound once my mom discovered that. And she actually discovered it just by reviewing his pharmacy records. So she was looking at the record. She saw this uh, drug that he had been getting that she did not approve and that he had not been on. She called the nursing facility. They took it off. Then he did bounce back. So thankfully that didn't cause any long-term harm. But then she got a call later from the billing department saying, you owe us $400 for this examination and we need his Medicare information so we can bill Medicare. And my mom said, what examination? And so the irony, you know, here I wrote a book called Never Pay the First Bill and Other Ways to Fight the Healthcare System and When. And they hit my own family with one of these bogus medical bills. And so we contested that. And in this case, sometimes it's easy to contest a bill and sometimes it's difficult. And this would be one of the cases where it was more difficult. I mean, it took a lot of calls, a lot of emails. My older brother had to go to the facility, get a copy of the medical records, but eventually we were able to pressure that physician group to drop that charge. It did take some negotiating and contesting of that bill. Fascinating, obviously, what this means also at a industry level. What are you seeing in your research? Does this happen a lot? Does it happen some of the time? How do we draw from your personal experience to what's happening more broadly and as you write in your book as well? I think problems like errors in medical bills are massive problems. And there are so many claims being processed by the system, millions a day. Even if a small percentage of those has an error in it, I don't know what the error rate is. So it's, it's hard for me to say. I anecdotally see a lot of errors in bills, but I'm the one getting bills from people who know that they have problems, right? So many of them, I'm sure, are processed without any problems. But the problem is there's such a high volume of bills being processed through the system that the errors, I think, are very common in medical bills. And when I say an error, I mean a charge for something that didn't happen or an upcoded bill. So let's say a patient received a very simple emergency room visit that should have been a level one or a level two, but it gets billed at a level four or a level five. That I think is incredibly common because on the front lines in the hospitals, again, it's not the clinicians doing this, the doctors, the nurse practitioners, the physician assistants, they're not the ones doing this billing. It's the billing departments for the hospitals. In some cases, it's like a private equity owned emergency room physician group or something like that, where they make a business model of juicing those codes, just upcoding it as a four or level five. And I think that's very common. So I talk a lot to people who do data analytics on medical bills. They say that upcoding is something they see very commonly. And I talk to a lot of other vendors and experts who can test medical bills. They also say that it's incredibly common. And the problem is it's not just that there's the error in the bill, but even when the patient identifies the error and contest it, the insurance company and the hospital don't back down. So it requires a lot of persistence sometimes to get them to do the right thing. The number two problem I see though all the time, and this is just the way the system works, is the bills are overpriced. And some people would say, well, what's overpriced? I mean, if your insurance company agrees to a rate with a hospital, that's the price, right? That's how it's always been. 
And what I'm arguing in my book is that there is no reason that one patient should be required to pay exponentially more than another patient for the exact same service at the exact same hospital with the exact same doctor. And you see this all the time. This is just built into our system that working Americans, for example, are required to pay between two and 10 times more than a Medicare patient for the exact same services. And so I would put that in the category of overpriced medical bills. So I'm showing people in my book how to contest a bill when it's an error or when it's overpriced so that you can get a fair price for the bill. And I think that's something that all employers should be doing. And I think that's something that all patients should be doing so that they Mm -hmm. don't end up paying more than they should for the medical care that they need. So let's maybe dig into, obviously, we'll talk about what the whether it's the third party administrators, the plan uh, sponsors could do, but member advocacy, you talk a lot about that in the book. What do you mean by that? And what can a patient do for those two scenarios? I think the member is the most underutilized advocate in the healthcare system right now. In my book, I really try and empower and equip the member to stand up for themselves Because in certain ways, the member has a lot more power and a lot more influence than even their employer or their TPA or their broker or someone else who would step in on their behalf. And here's where the member has a lot of power. First of all, every patient has a right to get their medical records. Every patient has a right to get the claims that have been submitted for the care that they received. So When the patient knows that, then the patient can go and do that legwork because it does require, again, it's not hard to do, but you have to know how to do it. You have to make some phone calls. You have to make some emails. You might have to go visit the records department at your local hospital. No employer is going to be able to do that for all the members. No broker can do that. No TPA can do that for every single member. But if each member can be empowered to do that and they can make it a standard practice, Get your medical records. Every patient should have a copy of their medical records. And every state in the country, it is their legal right to have that. Well, when you know that and you can get those records, then you can check and see, does the bill reflect what's documented in the medical record? Because the saying about medical records is, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. And so I found a lot of cases. Remember, I talked about the upcoded emergency room visits. So I've talked to multiple patients who have had a simple emergency room visit for stitches in their finger, in another case in their knee. And the medical record says it was a simple case. Well, then the billing is done as a level four, level three or a level four emergency room visit, which is for a moderately or intermediately complex case. This isn't a heart attack we're talking about. It's stitches in their finger. It does not require an extensive problem-focused history. It doesn't require a problem-focused examination. It doesn't require complex medical decision-making. All three of those elements are required for a level three or a level four bill. If you know that, and you know that your medical record says it was a simple case, well, then you have evidence on your side to contest that bill with evidence, not just with emotion or calling someone and yelling at them or griping or complaining, you can actually say, no, my medical records show that it was a simple visit and you've charged me for a complex visit and we need to correct this bill so that it's fair. A member will only do that if there's a kind of, whether it's a financial benefit or perhaps they are really upset about some wrong procedure that was done. Yeah. Why would a patient go after a hospital system for something employer is paying for it. A woman I just talked to the other day is contesting a bill on behalf of her husband. And her husband had a cut in his knee. He went to the emergency room. I think he got six stitches. But again, it didn't require complex medical decision-making, but this was billed as a level four emergency room Mm -hmm. visit. They have a high deductible health plan. So they are on the hook for thousands of dollars in medical bills because of their high deductible. So right now, 45 million Americans, I think, maybe don't quote me on that, but it's a high number. Tens of millions of Americans are on these high deductible plans. 
that number is actually growing every and year. It's growing. Fact, it's That's growing. right. Yes. It's growing. So people are very motivated now because it's money coming out of their pocket. They can't afford it. The Federal Reserve did a study that showed about 40% of Americans don't have more than $400 in their savings account. So when you get hit with a bill for thousands of dollars and you might have $400 in your savings account, you're motivated to find out, is this bill fair? Is this priced correctly? And so I think more and more, the dysfunction in our medical system has made people more motivated to fight back. And I think everybody knows Mm -hmm. that they're being taken advantage of. They know that they're being exploited, but they don't quite realize just how the system works and they don't know the leverage points that they can influence to have things work out in their favor. And so that's really what I try and show people. Yeah. In so what can a plant sponsor do to educate or enable that member for the situation that you just described, where it actually impacts their own high deductible plan? Well, I'm on a real health literacy kick now. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, that's mm-hmm. what my book really is. My book is a vision to equip and inspire working Americans and employers so that they will be motivated and informed to push back against these unfair practices. Mm-hmm. So I would say get my book. And then I'm also creating a series of health literacy videos that are based on the book. I just finished a really successful crowdfunding campaign. Mm -hmm. to do short three to five minute videos that are going to put these tips right at people's fingertips through on-demand video. And so I'm really pushing for health literacy for every member so that they can have a base level of knowledge about how to get an itemized medical bill, how to get their medical records, how to price the medical bill. And if people are interested in learning about that, you can go to my website, which is marshallallen.com and sign up for my newsletter, and I'm giving regular updates. I'm hoping those videos will come out early next year. Those are two things that they can do, educate your members. But I think the more the TPA world also starts pushing in this direction to educate the employers, you know, the employers really need to step up here. I think we're past the time where employers can just look the other way while they raise the premiums and raise the deductibles and reduce the amounts of coverage that their health plans cover. I think employers need to step up. And where you see employers stepping up, you see huge success. They are able to lower the cost and raise the quality of the benefits that they provide for their employees. But it takes some courage. It takes stepping outside of the box that the big insurance carriers and the big hospitals have us in right now. Right now, they want to keep us in the dark about the way these benefit plans are designed. They want to keep us in the dark about the price variation, which is totally unjustified. Mm -hmm. And they want to keep working Americans paying more than they should. I mean, that's big margin for the hospitals, for the insurance companies, for the pharmacy companies, pharmacy benefit managers. This is how they make their bottom line. And so it is going to be a bit of a battle and it's going to create some pushback, but we need more employers to step up. So I think the TPAs can help educate the employers too, so that they can help their members step up. So, you know, you talk about the price transparency, more like variation two to 10, 10 times from what CMS pays. So there's this regulation coming into effect next year in 2022 which will make a lot of this data available. As TPAs have this data, first of all, what is really possible with this data that's going to be made available to the TPAs? The data is a total game changer. I mean, it's been incredible just what we've seen at the beginning of this year with the hospital price transparency final rule, where hospitals now are required to post their prices. And many hospitals have not been complying but many have been complying. And what we're seeing now is this unjustified price variation laid out right on hospital websites. So hospitals are now reporting, you know, say for a diagnostic colonoscopy, that one patient, if they're covered by Medicare, might pay $500 or $700. Another patient, again, I'm just throwing out numbers here, but covered by another plan, say Blue Cross pays $900. 
Cigna, $1,800. United Healthcare, $3,200. The prices are exponentially higher depending on the health plan for the exact same services. That does not make sense, okay? <laughs> I know that's how it's always been done, but I don't think that the people paying really care if that's the way it's always been done. I don't care. for So I'll just say for myself, it doesn't matter to me if that's always how they've done it. It's not the right way to do it. Like my mom, who's on Medicare, if she and I go to McDonald's and buy a Big Mac, you're telling me that it's fair for her to pay $3, but I pay $6 or $15 or $30? No, it makes no sense. I mean, when I go to buy a set of tires or get my oil changed on my car, there's no other consumer transaction where working Americans are frankly discriminated against like this. And so the price variation that's exposed by the transparency is absurd. It's unjustified. And it makes people say, what is going on here? So I think that's going to expand exponentially starting next year, you know, just in a few months here, when the plans start making that data available. And I think it's been postponed a little bit now, right? Has it been postponed until the yeah, summer? So July. July. Yeah, to July. Yes. Yeah. yeah, but all the experts I've talked to say that this is going to happen, that they're yeah. not going to get away with keeping it silent. And one thing that I've learned about the insurance carriers, they do care about compliance. And so I think that whereas the hospitals have been dodging it, I believe my hope is that the insurance carriers, because they're careful with compliance, will follow the new federal rules and will yeah. make that information available. So I think it's going to maximize the impact. So Marshall, a very important question that many TPAs have on their mind is, well, first of all, members in the past have never really cared about these prices, even if we had them available. Like, okay, this particular procedure is $700 here and $900 there. And now that it's available, great. How do we ensure that members are engaged and are using this kind of information? What do you see from your work and research and and just your frankly, as you've been spending more time, what do you recommend? How do we get members to really use this? So first of all, I don't think it's that people haven't cared. I think it's that they haven't known. Nobody would ever think that if they get a knee replacement at hospital A, it will cost them and their health plan $20,000. And if they go to hospital B, it will be $60,000. <laughs> for the same type of knee replacement. I don't think people have known that in the past. I don't think they've known that if you go to the hospital for the MRI, it's going to be $1,200. But if you go to the independent imaging center for the same MRI, it's going to be $300 or $400. I don't think it's ever been known in that same way. So I think my first recommendation would be to broadcast this price variation to members. Do not hide these things from members. Members need to know one hospital, maybe it's the marquee medical center in each city. They are using that marquee name, that branding to charge exponentially more for their services. And in many cases, their services are not better than anywhere else. I mean, lots of studies have shown there's not a correlation between cost and quality in American healthcare. Maybe there is on certain really specialized services, but most healthcare that's being provided, I'm not trying to belittle it, but it's a little like an assembly line. They have a practice for doing a knee replacement or a hip replacement or doing an MRI or doing a blood test. This is not rocket science where they have to recreate the procedure every time they do it for a patient. It's very standardized. And that's good because that makes it safer and higher volume facilities are safer too. So it's good that they're not making it up every time. But we think sometimes that because it's medicine, oh, they can charge anything for it. No, actually, they shouldn't be charging high charges for it or high prices. So number one, I'd say make that known. Number two, I think it's important that we help members understand 
that ultimately, fundamentally, they are the ones paying for all of this health care. Their employer is funding their benefits, but those benefits are part of their compensation. So even if you have my company pays 75% of my premiums every month, well, actually, they're paying it out of 100% of my compensation. And so that pool of money that's used to compensate employees it goes to wages, it goes to health benefits, it goes to retirement benefits, it goes to paid time off. Well, if your healthcare costs are eating up all of that employee compensation, there's less money left over to give workers raises. And wage increases have been stagnant for years because of high healthcare costs. And so I think we do need to educate members so they understand, look, There's no magical health plan or health insurance plan that's paying your medical care. You are paying it. You and your colleagues at work are paying it out of your compensation. And so if collectively we can reduce what we spend on health care, there's more compensation left to give people wage increases and other benefits that are right now being consumed by unjustifiably high health care costs. So it's my hope that the transparency and the better informed employee will help them be more motivated to save that money. Even if they've already met their deductible and they're going to go hog wild and get some procedure at the end of the year. Fully agree. I think those are those two levels, educating them about this variance and then recognizing that, look, overall it's coming out of your pocket regardless. I also do think your point about as more and more plans are on higher deductible, being able to show members, even calculate at a member level, well, what does this really mean? While it might be $700 here and $900 there, out of your pocket, you're still paying 100 here and maybe 50 there. And so that calculation should be clear, should be very, very simplified for the member. I love what we're seeing some health plans do. And I know some of the TPAs that are listening to this, and I know some of the brokers listening to this and advisors are doing this. They are incentivizing members. They're identifying who the value, the best value Mm -hmm. providers are in their community. Say Mm -hmm. it's a hospital doing knee replacements. High quality, lowest cost, steer your members to those providers and waive their cost sharing, waive their co-insurance, waive their deductibles if they go there. And that Mm -hmm. way they can still have the choice. So they can go to whatever hospital they want for their knee replacement But if they go to the better value, high quality hospital, then all of their out-of-pocket costs will be waived. It saves the plan exponentially more. It saves the member exponentially more. And they get higher quality care. And we reward the hospitals and the clinicians who are giving us a fair price. So that's another big belief I have. As we see this transparency come into effect... The health plans, the TPAs, the employers, the advisors need to reward Mm. the hospitals, doctors, other clinicians who are not exploiting us. Reward the people with your business who give you a fair price. Penalize the price gougers. Shun them. (laughs) Warn your workers Hey, you might want to go to this marquee hospital in town, but did you know that that hospital charges three times as more for the exact same services that are available at this other community hospital in town? I mean, that's not right. And I think once people realize that their sickness is being exploited for profit by certain medical providers, I think that motivates a lot of people to say, look, that's not right. And I'm not going to participate in that. I just think, you know, we've been too trusting of the healthcare system. And we've assumed that the healthcare system is on our side financially, like they are when it comes to healing us and taking care of us. And sadly, what we've seen over and over again is that that trust has been betrayed. They have taken advantage of our vulnerability and used that to charge us more than they should so that we end up paying too much for the healthcare that we need. That's ultimately not an ethical way to behave. Yeah. So as we fast forward, let's say price transparency is in action and we've got all this data and we're educating 
members, what challenges do you foresee for this change to happen where there's a real member advocacy going on and members are using it? What challenges do you foresee ahead of us in the next two years? I think that there's going to be some squealing and some complaining by the higher priced price gouging hospitals and insurers and pharmacy benefit managers and everyone else who has been taking us for a ride. Mm -hmm. (laughs) They're going to complain. They're going to make it sound like, how can we comply with price transparency? It's too difficult. It's too complicated. How can we do this? Or they're going to try and act like they're better. You know, maybe they will try and say, well, you're not getting the same level of care that we provide. Maybe that's what they'll do. But I think that over the last two or three decades, our trust has been betrayed (laughs) to such an extent that we need to not trust. (laughs) We need to say, look, you know what? Um, We're going to try something different. We need to set the terms. We're the ones paying. The employers are the ones funding all of this. The employees, the working Americans are funding all of this healthcare. We need to be engaged in setting the terms so that we can be protected from being exploited. And so I think that we're going to hear complaining. We're going to see lobbying groups filing lawsuits to stop the price transparency, just like we did with the hospital price transparency rule. We should expect it. Don't be surprised when you see the trade associations complaining and saying that this is going to cause the sky to fall. It's not going to cause the sky to fall. It has not caused the sky to fall for hospitals to post their prices. No one's been harmed by this. In fact, they've been helped by it. I think we need to realize, let's look through the complaining. Let's look through the excuses that people make, and let's just expect them to comply with what the rules are say they need to comply with. So let's kind of bring a practical element to this now for our listeners. In order to really engage these members, you talked about this educational videos. Is there like any step-by-step guide towards these? Is there a style of communication you recommend to really get this type of information or knowledge that empowers, first of all, members? Yeah, let's maybe talk about this member education Is there a formula that you recommend? Well, yes. I think the formula that I've tried to follow in my book and that I'm following in my videos is to keep it really simple and very practical and very step-by-step, here's the things that you do. So for example, when people want to know what to do about analyzing a medical bill, I give them the steps. Number one, get an itemized medical bill. Make sure the itemized bill shows all the different charges that make up the total. Number two, make sure you get the billing codes. Sometimes those aren't included on the itemized bill you get from your hospital. You might need to go to your TPA or to your insurance company to get those billing codes. Number three, look up the prices on the billing codes. You can look them up on fairhealthconsumer.org. That's a website that gives you the average amount insurance companies pay in each community. You can also look them up now on hospital websites where they're following the price transparency rules. They post the prices. And if your hospital doesn't, you can find other hospitals in your community that are posting prices. And then with the price transparency for health plans, you can look at prices there too. So we're going to be able to start seeing fair prices and what is a fair price in your community. Then if you're being overcharged, Contest it. Stand up for yourself. Call the billing department. Tell them that you want to pay the lowest price that they're accepting in their hospital. Disregard what they tell you when they say your insurance plan has agreed that you'll pay this price. What kind of situation is it where the health insurance company teams up with the hospital to decide what the employer and the employee pay for services? That's not right. Mm. I didn't agree to those prices. So we need to assert ourselves. We're the paying customers. We need to be the ones to stand up and say what is fair and make sure it is fair. I'm certainly not saying don't pay your bills. I mean, of course, you have to pay your bills, but make sure it's fair and accurate before you pay it. So I think to communicate these things, it needs to be very clear. It needs to be very step by step. 
And we also need to show people why it matters. Show them. Like I say, if you look at my messaging on my website, in my book, and in my videos, over and over again, I tell people, with each of these tactics, you might be able to save hundreds or even thousands of dollars per healthcare encounter. I mean, there's a massive amount of money at stake here. Some people they'll bend over and pick up 25 cents that falls on the ground, right? In fact, I would. If I saw 25 cents on the ground, I would stop and I'd pick it up. We're talking about hundreds or thousands of dollars that can be saved every time you undergo medical care. It's worth it to look at these things. I try and show people there's real value here. There's a lot of money at stake and you could save piles of money. What's been the success rate of of these situations where a patient has fought or at least gone through these steps that you just described? Well, so I document dozens of cases, scores of cases in my book. I've helped dozens of patients myself. The success rate from my experience is very high because they're not accustomed to a patient being informed and standing up for themselves. So Mm. I have found that patients can have a lot of success by pushing back. So like 50%, 75% of the time? I would say 100% of the time. Oh, wow. Okay. It depends on how you define success. You know, I mean, so the worst case scenario is that you're going to be stuck paying what they're already telling you to pay. So you're already losing. So if you can get any discount, is that a success? I mean, you can always get some discount, but I'm talking about real success is getting bills waived, getting unfair bills forgiven entirely. I talked to a woman the other day who was advocating for her sister who had a $129,000 hospital bill mm-hmm. at a nonprofit hospital. And she did not know about hospital financial assistance policies. Well, I have a whole video on hospital financial assistance because they're required, nonprofit hospitals are required by law to provide financial assistance to justify their nonprofit status. So I asked this woman about her sister's income. It turns out her sister is below the federal poverty line. She would definitely qualify for financial assistance. So the woman looked up the financial assistance policy for the hospital where her sister stayed. It was an 11 day stay. She sees that her sister definitely qualifies for financial assistance at this hospital. So now she needs to apply. She needs to fill out the documentation, but I expect that to be successful. And I mean successful, they should waive that entire bill of 129000 Now that bill, that hasn't happened yet, but I helped another young woman successfully appeal an insurance company denial that was more than $70,000. I've had patients take my advice. In fact, if you read my Amazon reviews for my book, Never Pay the First Bill, I love the reviews where people say, I put this into practice and I saved money. You know, like one guy went to an independent MRI center and saved $1,500 on his MRIs. And he wrote that in his review. So I love that. So I don't know what percentage are they successful? I don't really know. But I think the thing is, is that people have not really known this before. And so as they learn it, they get to put it into practice. And it's very empowering for people. It's really fun because people can stand up for themselves, get engaged, control their own destiny. And the worst case scenario is that they're going to have to pay the bill that they were already required to pay. So they've got nothing to lose. This is great. This has been fantastic. You really kind of, as you bring up these personal stories of how fighting for this has led to success. I think this is phenomenal. And I think things will only change as we see more of this data, as you described, being available, not just to the patients, but to the system as a whole. I see tremendous kind of opportunities coming up. Really appreciate you taking the time. If listeners want to get in touch with you, how do they get in touch with you? So I encourage people to go to my website, marshallallen.com and sign up for my newsletter. You can also reach me there and you can always email me. My email is marshall at marshallallen.com. And if people are interested in bulk buys of the book, a lot of people have been using the book to help educate employers or members about how they can be more assertive and take control of their healthcare costs. You know, the book does have three chapters for employers, too, that really lay out what employers could be doing right now. And so 
I'm really thankful that a lot of people have found the book to be beneficial. And so contact me if you're interested in bulk orders, or even if you have a question, I really enjoy talking to people out there on the front lines, really wrestling with this because I learn a lot from those conversations and then I do my best to help people too. So I encourage people to reach out. It's great. Well, there we have it. Our listeners can actually get in touch directly with you. Yes, uh, please. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for taking the time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And I would like to thank FIA Group, our sponsor of this show. Please join us again for another podcast in the series brought to you by HCAA's Voices of Self-Funding. Please like and share on your favorite podcasting tool so we can build a community of like-minded people and tell us about topics that we should bring to you next. Please watch your email for updates on upcoming guests. I'm your host, Ramesh Kumar of Zaki.com.